Hello, you're listening to Copy Time, a podcast series on markets and economies from DBS Group Research. I'm Tamir Bey, Chief Economist. Welcome to our 45th episode. A couple of weeks ago, we spoke with Shamiran Abed, director of BRAC, one of the largest social enterprises in the world. Today, we go to the other end of the spectrum to talk with the founder of a relatively young and small social enterprise that is nevertheless having seriously good impact. Ajeta Shah is founder and CEO of Frontier Markets. Frontier Markets aims to connect rural entrepreneurs and customers, and it's based in Jaipur, Rajasthan in India. It has evolved from a high-touch to a high-tech digital platform for working women across multiple states in India, adding vital services based on market demand. Ajeta has spent over 15 years in rural India, working on microfinance, rural distribution, marketing, gender-inclusive business models, and technology. She has received a number of awards and accolades, including Forbes 30 Under 30 Digital Women of the Year. Ajeta Shah, welcome to Kopi Time. Thank you so much. Really, really excited to be here. Thank you so much for the opportunity. We're we're excited to have you. Ajeta, let's begin with your journey. You are of Indian origin, but you were born and raised in the U.S. What made you come to India, not just India, but rural India? Yeah, it's a great question. And I, and, you know, I always, it's, it's always lovely to reflect on the fact that it, that was 15 years ago or 16 years ago when I started my journey. But, um, you know, I've always been connected to India, right? Growing up in the U.S., my family was a very close-knit Jaipur community, originally from Rajasthan. So I had very traditional upbringings, to say the least, right? Uh, growing up as a, a girl, Girl in in New York, you would think that I was, you know, Western and modernized, but we were actually a very uh, uh, time capsuled community where I learned how to read, write, speak in Hindi, and make chai, while also actually learning about what it means to be American and be um, a global citizen. Um, so it was a very dichotomous upbringing. Um, my reason for coming to rural India, though, I think, was probably more about the timing in which I grew up in the U.S. Um, In the 18s and 80s and 90s, um, you know, America was kind of the epicenter of a lot of global events from, you know, the Gulf War to setting multilateral centers to humanitarian responses. And then, you know, in high school, I saw the shift, right? 9-11 happened when I was 17 years old. Uh, When I was in college, we were going to Iraq and Afghanistan, and I was kind of studying international relations at the time and really struggling with my own dichotomies of trying to understand understand, you know, what was happening in the world, what was my role in, 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 in the opportunities and chaos that were happening, and how does it all connect to my own identity? So I spent my college years really trying to understand that. Um, I, you know, interned in politics with the U.S. Congress. I got trained in mediation, conflict resolution at The Hague, and, and there were key learnings that I think probably influenced me to kind of make it full circle back to India. Um, I realized I had a responsibility to understand my role the world, which was not necessarily about my community or my family only, but actually my positioning as a global citizen. In my trainings at The Hague, I learned um, that the best way to truly uh, negotiate and be uh, and develop partnerships was through empathy and deep understanding of culture, history, and identity. And, 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 and I realized that, you know, in the time of chaos, uh, politics of fear and hate um, I really saw that economic development and poverty alleviation were going to be the central focus points for me in terms of equalizing the world. I wanted to understand how, right? How do we unite a much larger part of the world that was not the top 10% privilege? And so all of that culminated into me wanting to, um, you know, get back to my roots. I wanted to get back to India to understand India at that time. In, in the early 2000s, India was going through its own revolution. We were looking at India uh, trying to understand its own growth rate as a country. We were looking at India trying to understand its leadership as a nuclear player. We looking at India also dealing with a lot of chaos. And what always stuck to me was that if I wanted to be a part of a large initiative where I could see myself as a global position, I needed to understand myself as an Indian myself as a global citizen, my understand my role in economic development. And, you know, all of that kind of brought me back to India. And I, I entered into the world of the microfinance space uh, right after college. I told myself I would, you know, take a year off uh, from school. I would go to India to kind of understand things. Uh, I would try this thing called microfinance. And uh, it was supposed to be for a year and it became 10. 
and I never left. But Ajita, it is one thing to have roots in India and getting back there. And it is also, you know, understandable, you know, that you find your calling in microfinance, but the easy thing would have been to join one of the very large NGOs in India and spend a fairly, you know, fruitful uh, career there. I mean, going down the right of, route of entrepreneurship is extremely arduous and, and challenging. Uh, how did you make that pivot? Very interesting question. So, you know, I think that anyone that would say that, oh, I always knew I was going to be an entrepreneur um, is probably, um, that's not me. I mean, I had no idea that I was going to be an entrepreneur. I think that when I was in the microfinance sector, um, you know, it was the luckiest time for maybe a 20 year old to be in that space, right? From 2005 to 2012, microfinance in India was at the epicenter of innovation, uh, scale, evolution, revolution, and demise, and then recreation, right? We had an entire journey of seven years of interesting work. I, as a young 20-year-old, got the opportunity to spend um, my time just learning and absorbing and trying everything that an entrepreneur does, right? Take risks, do projects, do experiments, and try to understand how to solve big problems. Um, I realized I loved it. And, you know, in that time, uh, uh, I was able to live in multiple different states of India, which, which you know, Timur, is like multiple countries, um, and spent a lot of time uh, working on several projects, which were very much focused on uh, how do you bridge the gap of access to rural customers and solutions. And I guess there were all many uh, entrepreneurial businesses in themselves, and I did not know that until I finally had the bug. I think I spent so much time trying to crack project problems that I got frustrated with the fact that I couldn't solve it within the framework or the infrastructure that I was under, which for me was a being an employee and not being, you know, an owner. And B was also that the structure that I was under was a microfinance system. I realized a new business had to be created. Um, so I tried, I mean, I, I think I told myself, I'll take a break from microfinance I'm excited about wanting to solve a problem that I've been trying to solve, but I couldn't within the framework I was in. Let me try to do some pilots. I always say, think in pilots. And if the pilot is successful, it'll become a company. Um, and that's kind of how it started. Um, I, I, it was never, you're now going to be an entrepreneur for the next 10 years of your life. It was keep piloting, keep trying, keep, and every time you succeed, then you'll know that you'll keep going. And I think the succeeding and going in tribulations is now 10 years later that I'm, you know, a CEO of a company that has been around for many, many years and um, accidentally, but successfully. Well, of course, you know, that's a perfect segue into the whole journey of uh, Frontier Markets. So, yeah, as you said, almost 10 years. Uh, all right. How did it all start? Uh, I can understand the pilot, but then walk us through the rest of the journey so far. Yeah, so the premise of the company was always uh, uh, very clear. Uh, I Through microfinance, I learned that uh, the rural economy um, had a lot of market opportunities that were pretty much missed, right? Uh, rural households, uh, you know, 700 million of them um, were all ultimately deprived of good access to quality products and services. There was a supply chain gap that I kept seeing um, and and it was frustrating me because ultimately what we saw was that the rural rural family, the center epicenter of India's productivity and the agri evolution revolution, um, if they did not get access to good quality products and services that dealt with electricity or healthcare or clean water or what may not be, there will always be a sense of vulnerability and we'll never get to see this big you know shift right in power of this rural economy. So uh, Frontier Markets was really set up to bridge that gap. Very straightforward. We wanted to set up a company that could connect really great product and products and services to really big rural marketplaces. Um, and what we saw very clearly was um, on the supply side, you had fantastic innovations. You had amazing product companies that were creating really cool solar solutions or really cool agri products or really great um, services. They just weren't reaching this rural customer. So Frontier Markets wanted to be that bridge. So Pilot was me spending about $30,000 of my remaining money in trying to figure out how to make that happen. Um, in 2012, uh, you know, I used that money to say, 
I am going to tackle clean energy as my first area of focus. Back in 2011, that was the biggest challenge that we saw up front in the rural sector, right? India was quite unelectrified and solar would have been a very interesting, clear cut solution to address that challenge. How do you bring in electricity or lighting to people that don't have access to wiring, right? Off-grid electrification became very clear. Um, once what I, what I knew very straightforward was that if I can reach the rural customer and I can tell them the opportunity of solar and I can get them a good quality product delivered to their doorstep and they trust me and believe me, I can then scale that and replicate that. So 2012, when I proved that pilot works, um, we brought in our first set of capital um, and our first investor was actually not you know, an impact investor. It was a very traditional Indian VC investor seed fund. So, um, and really the thesis for that investor was, we like you, Ajeta, you're very hyper and interesting and energetic. We think what you're trying to crack in rural India is really fascinating. We don't think you're going to succeed. We don't even think we're going to get our money back, but, you know, maybe we'll learn something, right? And, and, and that investor has been with me now for 10 years, right? Seed Fund was our first investor. Um, the evolution then grows really quickly, right? We went from being an energy access company uh, to then, you know, shifting. I'd say there were three major shifts in the last 10 years. So going from being a single vertical energy access company to becoming a multi-product, multi-service platform. Today, we don't just sell energy products. We actually sell um, everything from consumer electronics to durables, to appliances, to agri solutions, et cetera. Second major shift is we went from being a gender agnostic to a very gender inclusive or gender centric company. So, you know, when we first started as a business, we didn't know how we were going to localize that supply chain. Who was going to be our entrepreneur that was going to connect us to the rural customer and deliver these solutions? We originally thought it was going to be shops, shopkeepers, men. And in our evolution, we realized that if we were going to truly understand the rural customer and enter the doorstep where they live, we were going to create a network of women entrepreneurs, a women sales force. Today, we have 10,000 women entrepreneurs and only women entrepreneurs as a part of our platform. So it really drove us to become a very gender inclusive, gender centric company, which has been fascinating. I'd say the third major shift has been that we went from being a, a non-tech, high-touch only company to becoming a very tech-inclusive company. So uh, we now have a 10,000 women sales force who's exclusively using our digital platform to become an assisted e-commerce solution. So, and, 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 and these evolutions really have happened uh, as a response to India shifting. India has gone from being a unelectrified, hard to reach, um, disconnected um, ecosystem to becoming a very well connected 4G powered, you know, technology epicenter where you really see um, a really big evolution happening. And what Frontier Markets has been able to do in the last 10 years is listen to the customers, respond to the ecosystem, raise the right capital at the right time and, you know, keep pivoting to respond to that challenge. That's great. And, you know, highly, highly inspirational to hear. Uh, I'm sure those 10 years, the way you sort of talked about the three key aspects uh, have come with their challenges. Uh, and we'll talk about them momentarily. But since you just ended on that notion of your uh, digital platform, I'm really curious, uh, the sort of apps, the sort of marketplace that you have put in place, and how long did that take? And how are women in the rural areas who may or may not have a high degree of literacy handling using an app like that? Yeah, thanks, Tamar. So, so first, uh, firstly, we'll say the women that we work with um, are, as you rightfully said, um, very, very rural. They live in, um, in villages where we're talking about a population size of not even 300 households. And we've been recruiting these women through, um, you know, grassroots communities, right, that have been NGOs that have been really nurturing these women for many years. India's largest initiative, which I've always been so proud of, has been the National Rural Livelihood Mission, where they you know, have created these over 165 million women are part of these collectives where they've been socially empowered and they've been um, saving money and they've been a part of an ecosystem. These women have not been connected through any sort of digital inclusion, right? They've never had a smartphone. They've never had um, access to technology. Um, 
And for a very long time in rural India, you would never imagine that being uh, an opportunity at all. I think in 2016, 2017, when demonetization happened in India, the counter of that was also digitization in India, right? All of a sudden, uh, rural villages, um, 88% of rural villages had 4G connectivity. The the, the driving price of feature phones and smartphones went down. And all of a sudden, it became possible for our network of rural women entrepreneurs to access um, uh, digital phones if they wanted it. So how we designed for that was we asked our rural women. At the end of the day, these are the women that are connecting to our customers, right? They're the ones that are responsible for meeting the rural households, communicating with them, taking their orders, right? Becoming the service provider for this rural customer. She herself said, can't you give me a technology tool that allows me to do my work better? Now, we didn't understand what better meant. And she literally said, I want to be able to collect data. I want to be able to showcase products. I want to be able to place orders. And I want to be able to make payments on my phone. Can you make that happen for me? And so really, our technology became a app um, that we call the Mehdi Saheli app, which really was a solution designed for her. It was her assisted tool that was going to allow her to do all of these things um, to help the rural customer essentially be, become an online customer. So we call it an assisted e-commerce app because she's the assister helping the rural customer essentially get on a digital platform. She uses the tool to do all of these things. And she's also being able to use the tool to then track her outcomes. And what's been really exciting is that this entire app was designed by her. She told us everything that she wanted to happen. And most importantly, that meant that we also had to make sure that it was um, it was it was di- digitally enabled to allow any illiterate person to use the app. So there was very little writing. It's very picture iconic focused. It's vernacular, so that actually you know anyone that's it's in Hindi, it's in English. And the most exciting innovation about this is that it's voice enabled. So there's an AI bot added to this technology, which allows any rural woman to be guided on what her work needs to be. She can literally open the app and there's someone who speaks in Hindi and welcomes her to her journey. And that app automatically tells her what to do. So she can just listen to the tasks that she has to do and she can use that to run her business. So this becomes a business in a box solution for her where she's able to do everything from sales, marketing, processing online transactions, Most importantly, all of this information is then tracked on our database. So we're actually able to track real-time customers, what they're purchasing, what they're ordering. And most importantly, we're able to deliver, again, tracking the same thing. So it's an entire full-fledged e-commerce tool. The innovation, I think, for me has been that it's been designed for the women that needed it the most. So when people ask me, I don't understand how you're getting illiterate rural women to use technology, we're saying that it was technology designed by them which is why it's actually scalable because anybody who knows who they are really well, they realize women are always saying that this was something that was designed for me. So now I want to use it to run my business fast. And so that's kind of been the evolution of that platform. And it's about two years old now. So we have 10,000 women using this platform. But what's exciting is they've gotten 350,000 households to then connect through an online shopping experience through their tool on our platform. Uh, Ajita, I should have asked you this earlier, but when you mentioned that you have expanded from energy products uh, to multiple goods, multiple services, uh, so within with using this app, what kind of products are being transacted and what sort of services are being offered? What we've been able to do is the Sahili uses the app to collect really critical data about her rural household. And we're essentially breaking down everything about this rural household. What do they have in their house? What do they not have in their house? What do they need in the future? What are their pain points? And what we've been able to do is we've been able to segment those elements into four key categories. Uh, The first category for us has been uh, really focused on energy access. It's still a critical part of what we see as a part of our product basket. So these are things like solar lanterns, home lighting systems, you know, outdoor lighting solutions, appliances. Second area for us was then uh, was consumer electronics. We recognize that there's been a massive 
um, desire for everyone to get access to smartphones and get access to critical solutions that allow them to be connected. Third category for us has been around um, appliances, so home appliances and productive appliances. So we know what households need for their home solutions, but even for their work solutions. So everything from sewing machines to irons to mixies to blenders to TVs, refrigerators, washing machines, right, have been added into our platform. Um, and then the fourth category has been, of course, very much around productivity or agri. So we really recognize that every single one of our rural families is connected to some sort of way to agriculture. So we've added elements like um, cattle feed to pesticide, to brush cutters, sprayers, tools, agri-appliance tools. And these are the physical products that we've introduced in the last uh, 24 months. Since COVID, we've added two more categories. Um, one has been essential services. So we've added um, literally daily groceries, hygiene, masks, sanitizers, sanitary napkins, anything that a rural household needs on a daily consumption that a, that a Saheli can provide locally. And we've added digital services. So what we recognized very clearly was our rural households wanted access to doorstep services of accessing cash, being able to pay, make online payments. And now we're even adding financial services, i.e. like consumer loans or inventory loans or working capital loans by partnering with other fintech companies. And all of this honesty timer has been systematic. It's been leveraging data coming from the rural household and then curating those solutions on a timely level. So the Saheli knows today what her household, what dynamic or positioning is her household in. Are they an agri family? Are they a family that wants to buy something for Diwali? Are they a family that needs essential services because they have four girls in the family who all need sanitary napkins? And she's able to actually use the data to help make very strong purchase decisions or help facilitate those purchase decisions to her rural families. And that's how the entire platform has evolved over a period of time. Very cool. Um, now, as you are in the, sort of the third year of the app, as you have sort of expanded into multiple products and multiple services, uh, just to step back for a second, I mean, now that you are running an organization with a number of people, with tens of thousands of clients, what are your sort of core guiding lights? What are your core values that you're trying to uphold? I think it's a really important question because I think that as we continue growing, we recognize that we're evolving into a platform, right? We are a platform that is essentially a gatekeeper connecting a massive uh, set of rural customers uh, to a you know massive industry of suppliers, right? Um, what we've seen in the last two years is more and more um, in the categories that I just mentioned, there's a lot of product companies that are eager to tap into this rural customer base, right? They want access to this marketplace. Our job, uh, frankly, is to be uh, the gatekeeper with a certain set of values or principles. One, we've always said that we believe the rural customer needs to be treated with dignity, that ultimately they deserve access to high quality products at the best affordable pricing with the right kind of delivery system. So we believe in doorstep delivery, we believe in after sale service, we believe in quality, which ultimately then means that this, and we believe in pricing. So we've been able to ensure that our rural customer gets the best product at the best price. We do not want to um, compensate quality um, over cheapness, right? And that's a really big, important element for us. A second major belief system that we've had is that we believe that um, it's our responsibility to do this sustainably. So ultimately, our entire value chain from, um, you know, the kind of products that we procure to the kind of way that we deliver those solutions, we've been very um, climate conscious. So it's been very much about making sure that we're able to bring in clean energy products, uh, energy efficient solutions. We've been able to also look at really trying to drive um, uh, reducing the cost of transportation by increasing our ability to optimize every time we place a delivery um, and tracking that and really trying to use um, technology to make stronger decisions of communication. Third element for us on a belief perspective is that women are at the epicenter of this. And our reason for this is that we believe that rural women 
have a dignified role of service that needs to be addressed in a world where, you know, we've been trying to understand our responsibility in an ecosystem. The gender inclusive element is a really strong part of how we operate. We believe that women should not just be included because of impact. We believe that they're smart business. We believe that when you start partnering with women, you're actually creating an opportunity for service and that there's an asset class that's being created over here that needs to be better addressed. And fundamentally, when women earn income in rural villages, they end up investing back into their children's futures. They end up investing back into their communities. And we like to see that full circle economy come in. So the investors that we onboard, even in our company, we ensure that these three principal values are aligned, that we have investors that have a gender lens. We have investors that believe in sustainability or climate. And we believe that they're investors that believe in the dignity of rural marketplaces or bring him, making sure that we're creating value for the rural customer that we operate in. So we'll never in, introduce a product that we don't believe has some sort of impact connection to the solution. And I think that's really been an important ethos of how we operate. That's fantastic. Okay, Ajayta, so we have heard about your excellent core values, and we know a bit about the journey that Frontier Markets has been through. Uh, you mentioned earlier that, you know, 10,000 clients. Uh, tell us about a few other key, key milestones that you guys have reached so far. Yeah, sure. So I think that for us, um, uh, the network of women entrepreneurs, our sales force, of course, has uh, is 10,000 women who have helped 350,000 customers uh, get onboarded to our platform. So what we do is we use our women's network to onboard our rural customers because our rural customers are equally a part of our asset class uh, in terms of how we um, look at ourselves as a B2B2B, to B2B, a B2B2C to B2 assisted commerce platform. Um, so the 350,000 households uh, till date have now purchased over 2.2 million solutions um, in the categories that we had earlier discussed, which has been quite exciting because what we're seeing now is um, an interesting trend of 67% uh, repeat rates of our customers. We have about 79% of our customers recommending um, us to new customers. So our um, ultimately our growth rate has gone up by almost two and a half X year on year. Um, we uh, have just restarted expanding our operations from Rajasthan into new states. So we're starting operations um, starting next month into UP and Bihar, uh, which is quite exciting with new partners. And uh, we have also, I think the critical impact lens for us has been really important in terms of financial assets that we've been able to create for our platform. So our 10,000 women entrepreneurs till date have earned over $15 million of income. And this is net income that they're earning which is really powerful. On average, our women entrepreneurs earn about $1,000 a year, which is almost three times larger than any income generating activity they've ever had. Um, and our rural customers, because of the products that we introduce, we track uh, uh, kerosene savings, we track income earned, productivity and hours. And totality, we've helped our rural customers earn over $25 million in income. That's great. Um, it's surely has not been just a, you know, smooth journey. I'm sure, you know, as an inter entrepreneur in this challenging area with infrastructure deficiency in terms of, you know, uh, sort of the entire setup of, you know, getting an entrepreneurial journey going, I'm sure you've encountered some challenges. Share with us some of those key learnings from those challenges. I think that uh, ultimately, you know, rural setting up a company in rural India, uh, the, the the direct correlation is challenge. Um, and I think that you know, in our in our last ten years, we've dealt with a lot of challenges. I think from 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 the fundamental reality that rural customers are in an ecosystem that is extremely unpredictable, um, whether it's related to climate whether it's related to vulnerabilities, whether it's related to um, policy changes. You know, as a company, we've struggled with a lot of different elements. Um, in the early days, uh, the fact that there was absolutely no chance of being able to bring in a technology integrated system because you couldn't really have smartphones or internet connectivity or electrification to rely on. 
So it, t- it took us a lot of time to really try to figure out how to reach these rural customers cost effectively. And I think that was a major area of challenges um, in, in terms of what we were facing in the initial, getting the right product market fit, understanding the right product companies to partner with, how do you trust whom, how do you deliver that system? Um, and doing that without any technology uh, was a high cost with a lot of challenges in itself. I think that um, over the last couple of years, other major challenges um, have been things like policy changes. You know, rural India or India has gone through so many policy changes which directly um, impact um, how we deal with our pricing structures, how we deal with our product partnerships, For a simplest example that I still remember very clearly was when India changed its policies from having VAT to GST. Now, and, you know, wanting to shift from being a, you know, global uh, import export, you know, manufacturing hub to focusing on make in India. Now, what did that do for us? We had solar products that we were selling in our platform. When we were dealing with VAT, solar had no tax on it. When you shifted from VAT to GST, suddenly there was a taxation element that was going to have a direct impact on your pricing for your rural customer. And how do you deal with that when you have built an entire brand around a certain price point? When you shift from making from global to make in India. So, you know, we had to constantly respond or react and shift our business models or our product partnerships or our supply chains based on policy shifts. I think the largest hit that all of us know very clearly for rural India was going to be demonetization. Um, I think demonetization was a very critical moment in our journey where we had to, you know, make a decision about what we were going to prioritize in terms of risk. By demonetization, Frontier Markets had over 150,000 customers and we had over 3,000 rural women entrepreneurs and we had over 100 employees. Suddenly in an ecosystem that was so cash dependent was supposed to shift everything overnight. We had rural customers that were scared, that had no idea what to do with their cash. We had rural employees that had no idea what to do with their cash. And all of a sudden we had a decision to make. Do we as a company shift um, and become digital overnight, which was going to be impossible? Do we recognize that when cash was going to be diminished from an ecosystem, would we stop trading? Would we stop selling products? And it's time where agri families had no idea whether they're going to get their new 2000 rupee note or not. And so ultimately, you know, in all these times of decisions, I think that we had to make certain stances. And I think the question that you asked about value is such an important one, because in these moments of trials and tribulations, you always have to ask yourself as a founder, do you support the um, short term viability of your company? So we ended up making a lot of these value assessment decisions over a period of time. Um, COVID, uh, again, I think is probably the most recent challenge, right? In an ecosystem where the entire country was going to go, went into a lockdown, right? Um, our rural operations were frozen. Now, what do we do as a company in terms of your position? Now you were a company with, at that time, seven months ago, eight, nine months ago, 4,000 women entrepreneurs, 200,000 customers, 100 plus employees who are all wanting to understand what's the next move. COVID and lockdown made us uh, realize that there's a very good chance in the next nine months, we will not have any business because we were selling clean energy products and durables at that time. And um, you know, we also had to recognize that there was gonna be a massive risk possibility of COVID reaching rural at a mass scale. And if that happens, everything shuts down yet again. I think the third fear that we had very clearly was, what will we do if we don't know uh, the outcomes of lockdown and the economy overall? And as a company, are we going to survive this? And yet again, you know, as a founder, we had to make critical decisions. Um, what we did at that time was game changing, right? We said, pivot yet again. Do not uh, recognize that this challenge is going to create a new, a new norm or a new market opportunity. And we ultimately you know, responded to COVID by saying that if COVID is here, We will shift our product basket. We'll focus on essential services. We'll focus on agri. We'll focus on what the rural customer requires. We'll shift from being a high-touch company to a massive high-tech company. We'll focus on really looking at digital tools to support our Sahelis. And we just had to kind of keep reacting. I think, Timer, for me, the consistency of our pains and trials and tribulations in the last 10 years is every time we've seen an unpredictable challenge that we face, 
we've used one core principle, which is what, how do we respond to our rural customers given this new challenge in front of us? And we pivoted. Second thing that we always said was in this challenge right now, how do we lean on our investors to understand these challenges collectively together and how can they support us to survive? And I think we've always been taking pride in the fact that you know every challenge that we face, whether it's running out of money, whether it's having to change your business model because it's not effectively working in this new norm of shifts, or whether it's unpredictable chaos, each and every time using the principles of listen to your customer, respond to your market, and lean on your investors has allowed us to thrive and, and shift and actually be where we are today, which I think probably has made us feel that if anything, this business model, this value system, and this market opportunity is here to stay. And maybe Frontier Markets is actually better positioned than anybody else, given the last 10 years of chaos, to take something that works really well and scale it. Yeah, I don't think you've had any shortage of stress tests in these uh, past mm -hmm. decade. Uh, so yeah, well done. You're battle tested, no doubt about that. As I said, the obvious fact about you is that you're a woman. So as a female social entrepreneur in India, how has your experience been? Huh, it's a, a very interesting one. I think that um, I'll say that um, I wish I was a, uh, a female social entrepreneur starting my company today versus mm -hmm. when I did 10 years ago, right? The ecosystem has evolved so much now, right? Today, you see gender lens inclusive accelerators. You see startup support from the Indian government. You see, um, you know, uh, financial investors designed to invest in women's startups, right? Um, you're seeing a very different ecosystem than what I came from. You know, I had to deal with three fundamental challenges, or I would say four, right? 10 years ago, the only example of social business that we really had was the microfinance sector. That's it. There weren't really any other companies that were considered to be social businesses. And India as an ecosystem wasn't ready for a social business infrastructure. You either had nonprofits or you had for profits. And that was kind of it. 10 years ago, I also then had to deal with the reality that there were hardly any women entrepreneurs. There were really not many women founding companies, let alone in my sector, right? I would have been defined as a supply chain tech company, or I would have been defined as an energy access company. And I was usually the only woman sitting amongst an entire ecosystem of men. So uh, constantly having to position myself as someone that was here because I knew my market, I knew my segment, and I can roll with the best was always something that I was constantly tested on. I think the third element was that I was also really young. Time I was 25 years old, right? Today I'm 36. So, you know, I had to come in as a 25 year, 25 year old woman entrepreneur who grew up in America that wanted to solve India's rural access challenge. So every single time I stepped in front of an investor or a product partner or an NGO or anybody, I constantly had to prove that my age isn't a factor, my gender isn't a factor, my accent isn't a factor, and please understand that I've actually done a lot of work on the ground and I'm here to stay because what comes with me that were my challenges perceived were also my assets, right? I was able to um, have that confidence to step into a room and speak louder than any other guy in the room because of my Western upbringing, right? I, and I was okay with stepping into a room and debating in, amongst the best of them. My, um, my, my asset as a woman, I knew where my resilience came from. I knew where my empathy came from. I knew where my ability to multitask came from. And that's really what was my massive asset in terms of really driving this model going forward. And of course, lastly, I think that my age gave me the energy. I mean, trying to crack last mile access at scale in rural India is a, is a, is a tough task to say the least. And you need to be in this sector for many, many years to really truly understand the pulse of a rural uh, customer. If I tried to do that at 45 versus 25, I don't know if I would have lasted. So today at 35, I feel like I'm tired, but it's because I was 25 when I started that journey in the first place. So I think that's probably the, the, the major reflections that I would probably have of the journey. But today I would say that um, these are the exact same um, challenges that have made me who I am, right? I, I come today um, 
you know, at 36, feeling like I'm 65. And, and I, uh, just because of the years of experiences and, 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 and those hardships and those challenges. And it also came with really strong mentors, right? I, I was lucky to have people that are really strong women leaders um, in India who had their hands on my shoulder, but also strong men. Right. Some of my favorite mentors are people like Shomit Ghosh and Vijay Mahajan, who were pioneers of microfinance, who constantly believed in my ability to drive this. And, and I think that um, had I not gone through those pain points, I could not have such large conviction of wanting to create the largest women entrepreneur network in India that's rural because I connect with the women that I'm trying to empower. And I connect with the customers that I'm trying to give dignity and access and placement. And I connect with an ecosystem that ultimately is all about impact and resilience. And I think that that's probably what makes me poised to see what the next 10 years are gonna be setting me up for. Okay, uh, look, first of all, I'm gonna disagree with you. I think you still have the energy of a 25 year old. I've seen you at work, so I know. <laughs> <laughs> and, yes, and, fair enough. <laughs> and secondly, uh, since you just finished your answer with the uh, vision for the next 10 years, why don't you elaborate on that and tell us what the future for you and for Frontier Markets uh, is going to be like? I've been thinking a lot about systems changes, um, and 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 I and I realize that um, I think COVID has uh, made me think about the fact that the work that we are doing as um, as a sector, like you know, the social entrepreneur space, is more is is more critical than ever, right? Um, it's critical because ultimately. Um, the social causes that we're all focused on, right? Whether it's climate, whether it's inclusivity, whether it's gender, whether it's access is extremely important because when things like COVID happen, the vulnerable become more vulnerable faster. And now we have this issue of time, right? We cannot wait another 10 years to reach a million women and you know reach a hundred million households and create this massive platform. This needs to happen in half that time. This needs to happen in the next five years, not next 10 years. We've lost that luxury of time. And I think that it's a good thing because it's making us think about the way that we reach that scale differently. Instead of believing that we're going to be a single organization that achieves everything on its own, we're recognizing that systems change will be through partnerships. And where does Frontier Markets and where does where do I come in to really um, become the center of partnerships. Where do we bring in government, nonprofits, right? Blended capital, suppliers, all together in the same ecosystem so that we can all come up with a shared value system of change where I, Frontier Markets, does not have to create every Saheli on our own. We can partner with NGOs at scale and hire them to create our network of women entrepreneurs because they already have that ecosystem or they have that placement. Where do I, not have to be the one that creates the next big product innovation, but we partner with all these incredible companies that are thinking about this on a regular basis and we connect them. Where do we partner with government to enhance policies to help drive you know, um, shared value assets or opportunities for these rural women in a different way? So I think that the next five years are gonna be about designing that systems change for frontier markets to not become the center, but become a, a, a player in that value chain where we have made this announcement just very recently. We said in five years, Frontier Markets will be the platform that has a million women entrepreneurs, the largest rural platform of, of rural women entrepreneurs serving 100 million customers. And we will do that uh, through this shared value system. Um, and we're very excited to kind of see that happen. Um, what that number will do is more exciting. Uh, that what, 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 it, what it visions for a future is more exciting is that Imagine a platform that is so large and empowered by rural voices that innovation is happening from the bottoms up versus the top down, right? Imagine frontier markets being able to sit in front of a, you know, agri insurance company and saying that, look, we have a hundred million farmers who are growing the following crops and they need this kind of risk propensity for saving. They'll buy your insurance today if you design it that way, right? Imagine us being able to sit in front of, you know, energy companies and saying, who's going to create the next big solar pump? 
for the 50,000 farmers will buy tomorrow. You're becoming a gateway of innovation in the way that I think it's meant to happen, which is about taking the beauty of what rural masses are and creating a marketplace that will allow to create shared value. And most importantly, the women that are going to be facilitating this entire process will be the center of that voice. And I think that's going to be changing the way we drive women leadership, that we drive uh, policies um, at, a, at a much larger level. For me personally, I think the next 10 years is going to be about shifting from being the center of frontier markets, like being the founder and the center and the one that drive that drives the vision to actually, um, you know, building the platform for our leaders. We've, we, we've been really, I've been really focused on wanting to say that, you know, my role as a founder is to now drive the next, you know, um, the, 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 the next set of leaders, right? It's really about separating Ajeta from the company, not because I want to leave the company, but because I don't believe I'm the center of the company. And I'm really excited to see that transition happen in a really meaningful way. And personally, I'm also very excited to be playing a larger role in the global ecosystem of really trying to move capital differently. So I've been a part of the Gender Smart Initiative for quite many years, but it's always been about frontier markets' need for capital. I think in 10 years, I could see driving the need of many frontier markets as needs for this kind of capital. And it's not, and it's going to be about really bringing the financial ecosystem to a different place where we can actually identify more frontier markets, more entrepreneurs and move capital a lot faster in a very interesting way, because I think I can bring that perspective to the table, which I'm really excited to like play a larger role on in the next 10 years from now. So Personally, I want to impact global inspiration by moving capital. Frontier markets will continue inspiring nationally at a much larger scale. And I think in between that, we're going to see a lot of people that hopefully can have benefits from it on a personal level, impactful level, and also profitable level to create market opportunities for all. Well, that's highly inspirational to hear. And I really appreciate your sort of you know, cogent and cohesive ideas for the organization and the need for having a depth of talent uh, that will complement your work and, and you know, make the organization much bigger than just a personality-driven one. Uh, Ajita Shah, we wish you the very best of luck, you and Frontier Markets, in that exciting journey ahead. And we'll be sitting here in Singapore watching you uh, try to you know, hit that uh, massive goal that you have uh, laid out for yourself. Thank you so much, Tamara. I really do appreciate it and always have appreciated uh, the support that we get from the folks at Singapore watching us because I think that um, the inspiration that we have from um, each, side of the, uh, each side of the world actually only makes us stronger. So we're looking forward to having you be there by our side and taking us, uh, being alongside of us uh, on the journey. We'll be there. Thank you so much for your time and insights. Thanks to our listeners too. Kopi Time was produced by Martin Taki. Daisy Sharma and Violet Lee provided additional assistance. It is for information only and does not represent any trade recommendations. All 45 episodes of Kopi Time are available on YouTube and on all major podcast platforms, including Apple, Google, and Spotify. As for our research publications, webinars, and live streams, you can find them all by Googling DBS Research Library. Have a great day.